Join me on my journey as I explore wealth in all areas of life. I'm your host, Mindy Kinnis, and this is The Lucrative Society. Welcome back to another episode of The Lucrative Society. I'm here today with my dear friend, Craig Clemens. I'm really excited for all of you listeners to get to know Craig because he not only has an amazing story, he has some pretty cool things to share with you. So first off, Craig, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mindy. Great to be here. Yeah, it's awesome to have you here. To give our listeners a little bit of background on who you are, what you've been up to, I would love to begin with just kind of the broad strokes of your career. You've done a lot of different things. You've had an interesting path. So if you could talk about a little bit of the evolution of your career, I would love that. Okay, cool. So start from the beginning or give a high level overview and then fill in blanks. Uh, let's start from the beginning because I know that the beginning is really different than where you're at now. So I'd love to hear the, uh, the contrast. Sure. Sure. So, yeah. So I was one of those kids who didn't do really well in school. I had a 1.7 GPA in high school. I was barely allowed to graduate. Luckily my mom knew the principal cause she was a teacher in the district and pulled a favor. So I got to graduate on the condition that I would go to summer school, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, right after school, I entered the lucrative field of pizza delivery, which was a whole lot of fun. And, you know, I got to drive my convertible 10 year old four banger Mustang around the city, eating slices of pizza. Um, smoking cigarettes, not proud of that, but that was what I was doing at the time. I remember I was really proud because the car was a stick shift and I could smoke a cigarette, eat a piece of pizza and drive stick at the same time. That was, that was what was on my mind back, back in those days. So I wasn't very, really, very impressive, Craig. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, uh, success minded. I was just about ha- having the best time humanly possible. And that was what I did when all my friends went off to college. They went to San Diego State or University of Arizona or all the schools that are popular for California kids. And I went into pizza delivery in junior college at a college called Moore Park. And as I was going there, I would be taking classes. And really the only reason I was there was because my parents wanted me to get a college degree. I, I, actually, I shouldn't say wanted, I should say they were forcing me to get a college degree. <laughs> I still wasn't doing good in school. So I would take a class and I would be failing and then I would figure out the exact day I could drop the class and not have the F count on my record. So I had this ratio for about 50% completion ratio of classes I'd sign up for to them actually hitting my report cards. So it was taking me, I would have been probably eight years in junior college if I'd stuck with that plan. So that wasn't going that well. And And I got a job doing telemarketing and that was fun because it was the first time I was getting paid to do something skill based. Now, yeah, if you can deliver the pizzas a little bit faster than someone else, you know, this is before Google maps, Mindy, this is I I don't know if you were even, you know, around during this time, but you had to pull out this big piece of paper with little lines and you know street names and stuff on it. You know what, Craig? You are not like that much different in age than I am. Let's just be clear about that. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. All right. So anyway, you could you know you could make a little bit more money if you could uh, know your routes a little bit better. But the telemarketing was pay based on skill, and it was straight commission. So if you didn't make a sale, you didn't get paid. And I went in there, and I was pretty good at it. I made a sale my first day and within a couple of weeks I was top 10 in a company of about mm, 35, you know? So I, I was, I was feeling good about me actually making money with a skill and it wasn't a lot of money. I was making, you know, a couple grand a month or something like that, but it was more that I was making delivering the pizzas and I heard about some other fellow junior college students of mine that had gotten a job at uh, a credit card merchant account company that helped businesses set up to take credit cards. And they were making five to $6,000 a month. And it was also telemarketing. 
they were just calling businesses and selling them something that had a higher price. Whereas I was selling uh, tools and industrial supplies to mechanics and farmers and, and folks like that. So I asked them to get me a job. They said, no, I think maybe they were intimidated. I don't know. And so I went over to the competitor of theirs and I saw that they happened to be hiring too. And I put in an application and I got hired again, straight commission. And I, I wasn't quite as good at that as I was at the tools because when you call people to sell them tools, you have to close the deal in the single phone call with the credit card accounts. It's a process, you know, it's a big decision for the business owners. So you got to follow up with them and yada, yada, yada. And because of my work ethic, I wasn't the best at following up. That said, I was still doing pretty well. I made $43,000 my first year there and I was only 21. So I was rich basically. And that was when I told my parents, Hey, mom and dad, I think I have a, a life path figured out that doesn't require this college thing. And so I'm going to drop out. I'm sorry, but I make made adult money. There's people at this company making a hundred grand a year. The top guy makes 300. I'm going to do this and, and see where it goes. And they were not pleased, but I did it. And then, you know, I was still living in a pretty boring town and all my friends were, they, most of them lived in San Diego and they were having a blast living in the dorms or, you know, trying to get their own apartments and going to parties and all that fun stuff. And so I decided to move down to San Diego and I thought I would just get another job at a credit card merchant account place down there or, you know, some other high ticket phone sales thing. And the first job I got was selling direct TV. And that was uh, about a $3,000 a month thing, but the hours were terrible. It was like uh, 11 a.m. to 8 at night, something weird like that. So it just ate up these like huge chunks of weird time. And so I only lasted there a month. And, and long story short, Mindy, I could not find another job for years. And that $43,000 I'd made, I was supposed to give half of it to the IRS, but I had to spend it because I wasn't making any money. Yeah, I've been there, done that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so flash forward, I'm I'm 23 years old. I'm having a blast. Go, still going to all the college parties, like uh, Matthew McConaughey's character in Days of Confused. You know, even though I didn't go to the college, but um, <laughs> broke is a joke. You know, two dollar drink nights saved my life, and even get food was a challenge at the time. I remember I'd clip the coupons to go to McDonald's. You know, get the dollar off the two cheeseburger value meal, and uh, I, I it was just one dead end telemarketing job to another, and. Then I met a gentleman who you know as well named Evan Pagan. And Evan told me he was making really good amounts of money selling information online to men that would help them get more dates with women. And it seemed a little confusing at first, but you know, he told me he made $4,000 one month and the next month he told me he made $17,000 and the next month he told me he made $70,000. At that point, I said, okay, man, I'm coming to work for you. I'll shine your shoes. I'll wash your car, whatever it is, yeah, man. <laughs> whatever you want. <laughs> the marketing thing is not working out, and I need to learn something else, and that's a shit ton of money. And he said, thanks, but no thanks. I didn't know that. Yeah, he wasn't really interested. <laughs> so, I, don't, I don't know why not, Craig. <laughs> so I go back on the phones, you know. Uh, at the time, I was working at a company that would help car dealerships sell used cars in a way that was shadier than they normally do. So we do think this thing called a slasher sale. Um, do you know what a slasher sale is? I don't. Okay. This is a, it's not really relevant to the story, but it's pretty funny. Would you like to hear? <laughs> I, I yes. Yes. What the heck is a slasher sale? So you, you announce in the uh, newspapers the, around the dealership that you're giving away a car for like six bucks. And then, you know, they get a ton of people showing up the day of, and you put a chain link fence around the dealership so they can't get in. And then you got a guy on the microphone, you go, ladies and gentlemen, be patient. You know, we're going to open the gates. There is a $6 car in here, but there's a lot of other cars that have been marked down and are at great prices today. And just put your hand on the car you want, and our slasher is going to go around and give you the best price on that car. 
And so I wasn't the actual slasher, but I would get the car dealership to take this thing as a marketing promotion. And so then they open the gate at 8 a.m. The people start running into the cars. You know, there's fist fights over the $6 car. And then the, the slasher will go over and there'll be a woman with her hand on the car and, and it'll say $12,000. And it'll be like, ma'am, you like this car, don't you? And she'd say, yes, I do. And be like, oh, well, how would you... How would you like to drive this car home today? And she's like, I don't know if I can afford it. Then he teaches get this big marker and he goes, slash, slash. How would you like to pay ten thousand dollars for this car? And she's like, oh. And then he goes, wait, it's not good enough. Slash, slash. How would you like to pay eight thousand dollars for this car? Like, okay, okay, I'll take the car. And then he goes to the salesman and says, okay, take this uh, nice woman in and write up the deal. And what the people don't know is that the dealership has taken all the cars and marked up the prices by four to six thousand dollars on each car the night before. So, it's so then you can slash them down. <laughs> yeah, it was just a big charade. So not my proudest moment, but that's what I was doing when I when I met Edmund and, and I, I needed to get the hell out of there because I didn't yes. feel good about what I was doing and I, and I was broke as a joke. So um, it was a losing combination. So I looked at what Evan was doing. And he was sending out these newsletters with dating tips and advice on email. And every, he said every time he'd send an email, he'd sell $4,000 worth of his courses. And I look at the emails and I thought, hey, I can write this stuff. I can write a dating tip. So I wrote one and it was called Two Tips on How to Kiss a Girl. And I forget what the tips were, but I sent it to him. And he wrote me back and he's like, okay, now we can talk. And, and yeah, I remember... Uh, thinking, wow, if, if I could write one of these a week and he'd give me 10% of that, 4,000, that'd be 400 bucks, that would be life-changing money for me. So that was my hope, but he actually gave me a job with a salary of $3,000 a month, which was extraordinary at the time. I hadn't, hadn't seen that kind of money in a few years. And when I did, I blew through it all. And uh, <laughs> at this point, I was like, yes, some of that back. So... I got the job and I learned that what he was doing, both in these newsletters and with the initial ways of speaking to customers, was giving a lot of information and then asking for a sale at the end in print. So you go on the, the web page for his dating advice book and it was like 20 pages, uh, basically just a really long sales pitch for how this book is going to help you get over your ex and meet 10 new girls this weekend. And one of them is going to be the uh, woman of your dreams to have a, uh, as your wife and make a beautiful family. And this time you're not going to fuck it up because you've got this book in your corner. And so uh, that, that was fascinating to me because it was the same type of pitch, Mindy, that I was saying on the phone when I would call a car dealer and say, hey, We've got this unique sales offering that is going to bring a bunch of people in. You're going to sell a bunch of cars. You're going to make a bunch of money. It's not going to cost you that much compared to how much you make. But I was having to call these dealers up and spend all the time getting through to the right person and then getting rejected by them and then having to call back a follow-up. Evan was just taking the sales pitch, putting it on a web page, and then the people were going and reading that, and he was putting it in front of millions of people on the Internet. And sure, a lot less of them would convert than the people – would have if you're having a direct phone conversation, but you could show it to millions. So it was basically salesmanship at scale. And that blew my mind. And that is what marketing is, salesmanship at scale. So I was fascinated and I started reading all the marketing books and Evan would send me to programs by legendary marketers like Gary Bensavanga and John Reese. I stopped listening to music in my car. I only listened to marketing audio tapes for three years. And that became my college education in a way. And I worked my way up through the company and I started doing a lot of that writing, which is called copywriting. And Evan is a master at it himself. So I had him in my corner training me and I, I became a pretty professional copywriter. And, you know, within five years, I was making really good money and salary from him. And on the side, I started a, a little marketing company with my two brothers that was doing like lead generation for other businesses using some of the things that I'd learned working for him. And my brothers were really good at doing the advertising, like buying banner ads and things like that. And that business started uh, doing, you know, a couple million a year or so. And, and a lot of it was profit. So we were making good money. And uh, that, was, that was kind of my start. That was from 2003 to two, two, 2009, about that. So tell me what you're up to now, because you, you're a very humble 
person and in your words, you know, a pretty proficient copywriter, you have been called by other copywriters, one of the greatest living copywriters today. So let's just be clear about where, <laughs> where you've come from and where you're at now. So tell me about your, your business now. Sure. So 2009, the recession hit, I actually got laid off from Eben's company and the business I started with my brothers just poof in like four weeks was making zero money. I moved out of my house in the hills. At that time I had a nice house with a pool. I had to move out in an apartment with my brother. I had to sell my Porsche and uh, I was driving this uh, like old Nissan again. Um, actually for a minute there, I bought a 66 Chevy Nova wagon because wow. I didn't want to have a car payment. <laughs> Fourteen thousand dollars or something like that, and then I was done. I had no car payment, and um, it would break down all the time. And I was, I was like, so I was like back, you know, I'd like re felt like I'd regressed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, back. And the only thing I wasn't doing was uh, delivering pizzas, but I had the skills now, and the skills uh, of copywriting, of marketing, and mindset that could not be removed no matter what the economy. And that's why I love what you teach, Mindy. It's so powerful because you're teaching people skills that people are going to have, no matter what's going on outside, they're going to be able to use the skills that they learn from you and these, these programs to be able to excel in any economy. And that's really important to think about right now because who knows what's going to happen in the next, you know, six months, three years, 10 years. Exactly. So I had the skills and I ended up partnering with another guy who wanted to make courses, a gentleman named Josh, and he wanted to make workout courses like P90X. He had dating advice courses ideas as well. So I partnered with him and my brothers. We started making and selling these courses and they did pretty well. And I was writing all the copy and, you know, Josh was the guru. My brothers were doing the, the advertising and the um, split testing and things like that. Then we got into nutritional supplements because Josh and my brother Kurt are really into fitness. They started formulating their own nutritional supplements. And uh, eventually we bought a small skincare company as well. And we started selling those. And that's how we got into consumer products. One day I was at a party in Las Vegas. I was, I was still uh, single these, these days. And I ran into an old friend of mine who was a cosmetic surgeon. He had a practice in Beverly Hills. And he said, hey, I heard you have a skincare brand now. Maybe we could sell some of those in our practice. I said, wait a second, you're a handsome cosmetic surgeon in Beverly Hills. Why don't you have your own skincare line? He said, well, nobody's ever asked me if I wanted one before. I said, well, we know this skincare thing now. Why don't we partner together and do this? And they said, yes, we struck a deal. We didn't know what a deal should look like, but we made something up. We launched a brand called Beverly Hills MD, which is still around today and, and doing amazing. And that was how we got in the business of partnering with people of expertise and building brands around their passions. So flash forward today, we have a company called Golden Hippo, and we partner with some of the world's top doctors and celebrities and, and experts and create great consumer products and uh, nutritional supplements, skincare, beauty, uh, a few other categories. Just launched a brand with Randy Jackson from American Idol. Uh, it's uh, about digestive health. You know, he's had a long journey in that and has lost a bunch of weight and doing amazing now. Just uh, partnered actually with Tony Horton from P90X. We have a sports nutrition brand called Power Life that is uh, shakes and, you know, all your uh, things to help you in uh, active aging. You know, it's for Tony's 61 years old. He looks like he's 40. It's for people who still want to you know, no matter what their age, be out on the tennis courts, on the golf course, running marathons, you know, it's the brand for, for those people that uh, really want to stay active and maintain muscle mass. So I've been really exciting to partner with some of the top folks in the world. And we never raised any money, but we somehow, uh, you know, grew the company and stayed profitable. And we have, you know, about 900 people across uh, five offices. We just opened our first, uh, actually our sixth office in Shanghai to go uh, bring our, some of our our brands internationally. So we're selling, selling Beverly Hills MD and Gundry uh, MD is another brand of ours in China. And man, this, uh, this COVID thing has been wild because we had to convert to a virtual company uh, from our corporate office, but our team has really stepped it up. I'm so proud of everybody. And, you know, we uh, also benefited from all the eyeballs on the internet and the mindset right now, everyone's finally realizing, hey, this health thing is kind of important. Yeah, Without maybe we need some supplements. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> you know, if you don't have health, you have nothing else. And so this, this has been uh, good for our business as, as, as challenging as it has been. We've been very fortunate to be able to keep uh, helping the world get these, these products that they need to maintain a, a, a good level of uh, health and vitality. So that's what we're doing now. And always looking for great folks to partner with and also always looking for great people to join the team. So that's, that's the, the lay of the land currently. Craig, I love your story because what it speaks volumes of is potential. You know, you go from like making no money, delivering pizza to where you're at now, which is such an extreme shift. So one of the questions that I ask all of my guests on this show is how do you define wealth? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, it may be a biased answer, but as I was saying, you know, I think everyone is waking up to the fact that as, as uh, my partner, Randy Jackson says, health is the new wealth. Right. But I mean, it really always has been. And I'm sure you've heard the saying that a healthy person has a thousand dreams. A person without health only has one. And so I think, I think first and foremost, you know, your health has to be there and that includes your mental health. I know plenty of people who are very financially successful that are miserable because they never did the work on themselves and got out those demons and, you know, the fears, frustrations, anger, it's inside of us all, you know, no matter how well our parents did things, uh, get, get a little sticky along the way because we just inherit things from our parents that they got from their parents and they got from their parents. I just went to an amazing workshop called a uh, Hoffman process. You might've heard of Yeah, that helped me unwind a lot of that. I'm always doing that type of stuff, you know? And so I, I think, uh, you know, health, uh, and then love is next. And, uh, you know, damn right. Money buys you a lot of happiness too. I, 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 I definitely think that there is, is nothing wrong with, wanting to have a level of income that allows you to provide well for your family, help out causes you believe in and get yourself some nice things and, you know, material possessions too. I don't think there's anything wrong with that either, but without health and love, you're going to be miserable. So, uh, you know, the, 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 the happiness that you can buy with money, if you don't have health and love is always going to be short lived. It's always going to be exciting to get a brand new car if you're a man, you know, most, right. most men, right? Or some guys are into watches or, or guns or clothing or whatever, you know, women um, have sometimes different interests, you know, it's always going to be exciting to buy something really cool material, but it's short lived. You know, there's the true depth of, of happiness comes from love and you can't really enjoy that if your health isn't intact. Not to mention, Mindy, as I'm sure you, you know, when your physical game is strong, when you're in your game working out, eating right, doing your meditations and, you know, keeping your body in, in primo operating condition, your mood is just a lot better. So my, my best friend, his, um, his fiance's son is having some, some, you know, mental health issues. Uh, the first thing I ask is, what is he eating? Totally. Oh, so he eats some fast food every meal. And that's where I'd start. I wouldn't start with the Prozac or any of these anti, you know, pills and whatever there is out there. Start with a diet because I mean, that's your body's fuel tank and, and what you're putting in is what you're getting out. Craig, I love everything you're saying because that is the whole point of this show. It's like wealth, happiness, where is that intersection? So I love that you're giving people permission to have that material stuff and you know, yeah, that can be fun, but also knowing that that's not gonna solve the problem. So I totally appreciate what you just said. There is a four part question that I have for you and I've asked this to each of our guests also. It's based on the acronym HERB, H-E-R-B. So H stands for habits and I would love to know from you, what are some of the habits that allow you to continue to produce at such a high level and and also have that happiness enjoy your life what are your habits i am still a vivacious reader of marketing books studier of advertisements 
hundred years old or brand new, if I hear of something that someone, whether it's a competitor or not, you know, in any space, if I hear something that's killing it, I go and dissect the entire advertisement. I watch the trends also. I, I think if I was going to summarize all that, it would be reading. I'm just always reading. I am trying to make the shift from less articles to more books, but I still read a lot of articles and industry newsletters. And then during this time when we've been in a downtime, I've been crushing about one book a week and I haven't figured out this trick that some people do where they only read like, you know, every third page of the book and absorb the whole thing. <laughs> you, know, you hear about these, these, uh, these people that can read a book in a day. It takes me, you know, a week if I'm really on it, but I've been going through about a book a week. Uh, as we've been in this downtime and, and that's been feeding my brain and making me feel really good. And it's just, you know, building that, that knowledge that keeps on giving no matter what the economic conditions. It, that's, that's what uh, reading and immersion does for you. And today there's so many amazing courses online that there's even a way to go above and beyond books. You know, when you, take these courses that people are putting together with expertise that is taught in 90 minutes versus, you know, a whole week reading a book. You can get someone's best stuff in 90 minutes now, thanks to the internet. You know, that, that wasn't really around that much when books were invented. I mean, there was classrooms and things like that, but like, I don't know if there was anyone putting together a 90 minute info product. And today there's such a blooming industry with programs uh, like you're doing with, you know, masterclass, which is a little bit more like a little bit less tactical, but you're also hearing from some people who are, you know, best in the world of what they do. And then stuff you're putting together, you're hearing from people who are best in the world of what they do and really tactical getting the nuts and bolts, but also the high level, like this question you just asked me, the habits. So uh, consume content. <laughs> That's is a, that is a big one that I, I still try to do a lot. Uh, let's see. I also am a, uh, a big fan of working out often. I quit running when I moved to LA because I lived on a really steep hill, whereas in New York, I lived next to the Brooklyn Bridge, so I'd run across it every day. And I didn't realize this, Mindy, this connection, but somehow I, I started hitting the wall in my days at like 5 or 6 p.m. I'd hit the wall and I needed to take a nap. And there's nothing wrong with taking a nap, but I would just completely take, hit the wall. Sometimes even the nap, even after the nap, I was still groggy and I was just done. You know, and sometimes it would happen as early as 3 in the afternoon. And I couldn't figure out the reason. I thought it was just because maybe I was turning 40 and because I was drinking too much caffeine in the morning. So I was like trying to, you know, alter the caffeine timing and all that. And then I moved neighborhoods and I started running again. That... Instantly, as soon as I started running three days a week, my energy came back. That is what it Think was. how that works, right? <laughs> I was still weightlifting, but I wasn't doing that steady cardio running. So I know it's kind of common sense advice, but even me, who's been a, a fan of fitness for a long time, I didn't even realize the, the connection to the energy with that extended working out. So that's a basic one. When I used to hear basic, uh, I, I like to say basic bitch advice from people. I would be like, what the fuck? Where's the tactic? Where's the, where's the single line, you know, the magic bullet. And then I had an experience with Richard Branson. I was on Richard Branson's Island with a, a entrepreneur group and I got up to make a speech actually. And this is three years ago when I just starting to get more into the public speaking game. And I got up and before, and he was in the audience and it was a three minute talk. It was this, this thing where you had to give your, uh, it was called the 180. And you have to give an idea that makes someone do a complete 180 in 180 seconds, right? So I got it to do mine. I said, okay, everyone, bear with me. I'm trying to improve my public speaking, but I'm going to do this. So timer, go. So I did my idea. And later, we're on a neighboring island, and I'm at the bar. And this was not Richard's island. It was, you know, an uh, island open to the public. But he walks into this bar. And my wife and I are on one side and he walks up to the other side and starts to order a drink and there's nobody next to him. And I said, Sarah, wow, is this our chance to go talk to Richard one-on-one? -on -one? Cause you know, you're at his, his, even though you're at his Island, it's a lot of other people and he's busy and all that. And so we had this opening, but I didn't know what to say and I didn't want to look stupid. And so I just 
thought, ah, oh, yeah, man, I should have, I should have read his biography before we got here. You know, like, so I just, I said, fuck it. I'm not going to talk to him. He looks across the bar. He sees me and Sarah over there. He grabs his drink, walks over to us, puts his drink down next to me and says, so you want to improve your public speaking? I said, yes, I do. He said, okay, well, here's three things that work for me. And he laid down three things that worked for him in public speaking. The three things he said to me were quite basic. And at the, at, at the summit, I'll say what they are. And I will also explain how I decided, even though these are basic, and I was like, oh, what is this basic advice? How I was going to dive deep on each of the points. And when I dove deep and really started journaling on what he said, I found the magic. And that's what I found is that sometimes it's the simplest advice that's the most important. It just comes down to applying it. It's so true. I tell my clients that all the time. Like my whole job is just to remind them of probably what they already know. <laughs> you know it's like just yeah. keep doing this very simple, very basic stuff. And then that over time creates the results. So moving from the H to the E, the E stands for environment. I would love to know what you allow into your environment or do not allow in to your environment to, you know, just keep your mindset sharp, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. So again, a basic thing, but my wife's a holistic health practitioner and eating healthy. I've noticed, you know, since I got my late thirties, uh, I cheated this morning, had a breakfast burrito. I'm feeling that in my stomach right now. <laughs> Um, if I eat my greens, I'm doing much better. I take like 80 different types of vitamins a day, you know, I, I'm on that. So, uh, I still have my cheap meals. I, you know, I got pizza basically in my blood as a former pizza delivery guy. So, you know, that's going to be on the rotation once every week or two, but, um, negative stuff is out for the most part. Negative food, try to push it out try to eat organic, healthy food. Most of the time, negative people try to push them out downer people that aren't you know, thinking about growth and thinking about improving their own lives, like being the best person they can be for their family, being the best family they can be for the world. Don't want to hang out with those people. So I look for people that have that, that growth mindset and I love hanging out with outside the box thinkers. So at the same time, I don't like to have in my environment, people who are closed off, closed minded. I, I, I hate hardcore Democrats. I also hate hardcore Republicans. I hate people who are just really biased and one-sided that aren't able to open their mind to different viewpoints. Drives me nuts. So Yeah, I'm with you on that for sure. <laughs> what about, I cannot wait to ask you this one because I know that we could probably spend the next hour talking about this, but the R stands for resources. So resources could be books, programs, you've already mentioned a couple, uh, mentors, events, whatever, what are some of the resources that have helped you develop and that you would highly recommend to others? So community is so big. You know, I love that saying that your network is your net worth. Yeah. And people think that they need to sometimes have all the, the growth in community from people who are, are above them, but no, it can come from people that are on your level and it can come from people who are the next level down because one of the best ways to learn is by teaching. Every time I do some type of presentation like this, I learn something. I'll tell you something I learned today. It is in this talk with you. What's that? I have never thought before that marketing is salesmanship at scale. That was the first time I thought of that. Nice. If I didn't say so myself, that's pretty damn smart. You know, that's a good way of putting it. I've heard that, that sales, uh, that copy writing is salesmanship in print. Well, marketing is salesmanship at scale, you know? So I just thought of that because I'm telling other people what I do. So teaching is one of the best ways to learn. When I was first starting off on my own, I would do marketing money Mondays. And we would get a few people together every Monday night, uh, or actually it was the first Monday of every month. We would order Thai food. We would split the bill and two people would share what they were doing that was working well for them. Nice. And that was transformative to everyone in that group. And when you have a group like that, then you can start inviting people who are badasses. I was reaching out to people. I saw, for example, John Reese was coming into town who was on a way higher level than any of us. And I said, hey, John, I got this group. We meet months a month. It, it, can I do it on the Monday that you're in town? You come, uh, come hang out with us and talk. You don't have to you know, do anything. We can just do, just chat. 
you don't have to do any presentation or anything. And he said, no problem, you know, because people want to share what they know. So think of community on three levels, you know, think of the, that teaching community, you're going to learn something by teaching. Think of a, putting together peer groups like I was doing. It doesn't take a lot of money. You don't have to have a, a fancy venue or anything like that. You can get a peer group together to meet at a coffee shop or meet and split Thai food or whatever it may be. You know, but do it regularly and have a format and be the leader. You know, a lot comes from also then you learn leadership. And when you're the person making the connections, then everyone wants to help you when you have an ask. And then the community can also benefit from people who are where you want to be. Because when you're the community creator, you can get the people to come be a part of your community and then you also get some more one-on-one -on -one time with them than everyone else does. So I would say resource was a question, right? Yes. Make your community a resource and be a community creator, be a community leader. Or if you're in someone else's community, step up, be a leader in their community. If you're a member of the Lucre Society, be the one that is doing side groups that grabs the people in your town and gets them together once a month to study these principles or, you know, tr uh, practice your speeches to each other on zoom, be the organizer, be a leader because you're going to have so much benefit and it's also building you skills that are evergreen and will benefit you no matter what you're doing. Totally. And you know what? I've asked a lot of people this question and nobody has talked about community. So that rocks. That leads us to the B, which stands for beliefs. What are some of your core beliefs or your world views, how you see the world, that help you to create the reality that you have created? That's a great question. So one of my big beliefs is that society often has it wrong. For example, there is that set path that you're supposed to go where you go to kindergarten or preschool, then kindergarten, then grade school, then college, then you go and get a corporate job. I mean, I wouldn't say it's universally wrong, but it's definitely not universally right. And society also pretends it's universally right. That makes society wrong. So, you know, that's one example, right? I mean, I, you know, this, so that, that's an important belief. Um, I think, beliefs also come down to something I'm, I'm learning more about recently, which are, are uh, mental models and mental models are ways of looking at different situations, but taking a same model and putting it on top of different situations. So an easy one to explain is the 80, 20 rule. Have you heard of that? The, the Pareto yeah. principle. Yep. Okay. So the short of it is, is that you're going to get, 80% of your results from 20% of your activities. So for me, it's writing sales copy. And for you, Minnie, do you know what it is? Coaching. Coaching, right. So the mental model is the 80-20 rule. Take that 80-20 rule and apply it to every part of your life. Ask yourself, what are you doing that's get, the 20% that's getting you 80% of the results? Applying it to working out is a great example. So if you're thinking about working out with weights, the 20% that gets you the 80% would be what are called compound movements, like doing squats, which work basically from like the, you know, your he heels up to, uh, you know, your like middle of your back, like that whole area, like half of your freaking body's muscle mass is being worked by one exercise. And deadlifts are another one that work a lot of muscle mass, um, pull-ups. On the opposite though, would be something like calf raises. It takes the same amount of time to do a set of calf raises that work this little circular area as it does to do a set of squats that work half your damn body. Yeah, you know what's funny about when you brought that immediately to fitness and health, that was the first thing I thought of when you said 80-20. I know for me, I can work out regularly through the week, but when I go on a big, huge hike, that absolute, like that's 20% of the whole week, but it definitely impacts 80% of my health and well-being. So I was right there with you. And as we wrap this up, I want to ask you, Craig, if people are interested in learning more about you, if people are like, this dude's a rock star, I want to know more about this guy. 
Where should they go? Where should I send them? Yes. Yeah, so I'm going big on the gram. I've seen the that. ID. My handle is just at Craig. And I have also decided to get more focused on Twitter. Okay. And it's, it's uh, different types of content because I, I like to experiment and see what works on, on different platforms. But Instagram, I have more motivational, inspirational type stuff. Twitter, I have more marketing insight, business development type stuff. So uh, my, my Twitter name is Craig Clemens, my, just my full name. Hit me up on both platforms. Tell me you found out about me through this interview. Yeah, and I'll link to both of those in the show notes on the site. So that's fantastic. And Craig, you are also going to be speaking at the Lucrative Speaker Summit. Can't wait. I wonder if you could give just a little hint about what you're going to be talking about. Yeah, absolutely. So I had been in business a long time and, and you know, kind of like needing to make speeches for different things to my company and I've been asked to speak at different mastermind groups and things like that. And they always kind of sucked. And I was afraid to work on it. It was very intimidating for me. And the toughest part for me was learning how to structure a speech. I figured out a way to structure it with the help of a lot of mentors like Sean, um, like a gentleman named David Nihil, and then uh, a guy I saw speak from afar who um, is the only speaker I, I, I've ever, I, I thought could keep up with Sean Stevenson, which is a guy named Jeff, Jesse Itzler. I figured out this formula that I'm going to be sharing. Once I figured out this formula, I plugged in just episodes from my life. And I, I gave a, a, what was people, the crowd said was a great speech. So it's, it's just a really simple way to take your own life experiences and structure them in a speech that crowds seem to love. And I've been just sticking with the same damn thing ever since then. It's been three years now. I just did this formula at Brennan Burchard's influencer event in San Diego to 2000 people. And I, uh, I got the loudest standing ovation of, of any of the speakers there. So it was, it was super exciting. That is awesome. And a little behind the scenes for our listeners. I love that story so much. And one of the main reasons I asked you, Craig, to be a part of this summit is that when you came to our event, 10K Speeches, Sean was basically like, ah, you know, I don't know about Craig as a presenter. So I'm going to give him like, I don't even know what he gave you, maybe 15 minutes, something really, really short. You came onto our stage and blew the audience away. And Sean was like, shit, I should have given that cat more time. <laughs> he had seen me before I figured this out. Exactly, exactly. Before, many times. I would speak at, at uh, Evan's programs. You know, I, I was no stranger to speaking. But I just <laughs> wasn't very good at it until I figured this out, which the th thing about this strategy is it lets you use your natural way of speaking, but on stage. You don't have to go learn to be a performance artist. Yeah, I mean, I have seen the result of that. So I am super excited for the Lucrative Speaker Summit that you're going to be a part of it. For those of you that are interested, find out more at lucrativespeaker.com. You can learn everything you need to know there. And Craig, I want to finalize this conversation just with a huge thank you. I have shared this story with you, but I think it, uh, it, it's a great story, so I wanted to share it with our listeners as well. A number of years ago when Sean had had a very serious accident, then was recovering for a long time at our teensy tiny little apartment in Scottsdale, Arizona, you were one of the first people that just came just to be there. And I just remember the feelings of gratitude that I had for you because you were like, okay, cool. Like Sean's not even eating real food. Mindy, what can I do for you? Cool. You want me to pick up food? So you went and got Chinese food and you came to our apartment and we just sat around and talked and you slept on our couch and just were there. So I have so much gratitude for you, for your friendship and just for everything that you're putting out into the world. It's truly been awesome to watch. Uh, thank you so much. I mean, that, you know, that, that night was just so meaningful and so special. It just shows that it, it's all about just being with people that are thinking outside the box and coming from a good place inside. And that's what life's really all about, you know, and, and that was such a special night. 
And I mean, you know how instrumental Sean has been to my growth. We're almost the exact same age. And he would, he was one, he was one of my friends. He was one of my first friends that had that mindset because when he and I met, I was 24, I think. And I was still, you know, up in the club every night and hanging out with a bunch of people who just wanted to party. And he was my friend that would be up my ass and be like, yo, when are you going to get your shit together and start your own business, man? <laughs> you know, you're too smart to be working for someone else anymore. When are you, when are you going to, uh, you know, really do something big with this copywriting? When's your book coming out? When are you going to get on stages? He was always pushed me and show me that really anything was possible. And so I, I definitely wouldn't be here today if it weren't for him. And, you know, getting to know you over the last few years has been such a treat and, so amazing that you carry the legacy and anything I can do to be a part of it anytime. You know, I'm I'm only one call away. Okay, I won't kill Oh God. Anyone. Well, I'm gonna wrap this up now before you go into serenade style. Thank you so All much. Right. My pleasure. So good to to connect with you as always. Really great. Thanks so much for listening. Make sure to subscribe to the Lucrative Society on iTunes and please leave a review of the podcast. Visit lucra.com for transcripts and resources, or to become a member of the Lucrative Society, where I coach purpose-based entrepreneurs on business, mindset, and heart set. Lucra, where wealth equals well-being. Now, Craig, how old are you? I'm 41 in three weeks. Okay, so I'm older than you. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. You looked younger than <laughs> Mr. I don't know if you were around for this, Mindy, these oh, maps. A little, a little sarcasm, but you know.